Hi, everyone. I'm Blight. I don't do this, and in over 200 videos I never have. But YouTube has not been, let's say, kind to my channel for the past year now. So, if I may... <clears throat> if you enjoyed my narration, please drop a like or a comment. Blood for the blood god, as it were. I would sincerely appreciate it, and it would help the organization immensely. Now, let's get into today's story. A Masterclass in Tension. This was the Blight Research Organization. Keep the lights on, folks. Trees could move in a forest every night, and you probably wouldn't even notice. There are thousands of the things in even a small forest. You couldn't possibly know the position of every one. Sure, if your go-to spot had moved, you might be suspicious. But even then, if you don't go often, you'd probably just think you misremembered. Forests have few exact landmarks. It's the same all around. You'd be forgiven for not noticing the change. For not noticing that the trees are alive. But when they're at the edge of your window, bridging between the vast empty black of the night and the safety of your own home, you'll notice. When the outside world can tap upon your glass. You notice those things. A child cries. I think I heard a noise at the window. The mother consoles. It's just a branch in the breeze, honey. Go back to sleep. You read that and feel relief from the explanation. I read that and feel fear. What could be worse than a tree at the window? A tree that was not there yesterday. I've lived on the edge of Inwoods for over a decade. It acts as the border to the west of our small town. There's my street, with Inwoods just beyond the back fencing. The woods continue for miles until the next town. They attempted to chop down the trees a few years back to expand our quaint neighborhood. The project was canceled after just a few days in favor of expanding east instead. What made them change their minds? What did they find? that made them want to head in the exact opposite direction. They are afraid of something in those trees. Deep within the roots, manifesting in the bark, perhaps even the leaves themselves, as they gracefully sway unsuspectingly. They have every right to be terrified. We all do. But I wasn't always scared of Inwoods. Quite the opposite, actually. I had a friend. Her name was Emily. We used to play in the woods often as children. Climbing the trees. Building dens. Nobody knew that place like us. If trees had moved back then we'd have known about it. I wish I could still hold on to those memories fondly, but knowing what I know of the woods now, I cannot, in good conscience, look back and smile. One memory does stick out in particular, though. A special destination that I always held near and dear to my heart. A few minutes' walk through the woods, staying on the dirt path, and keeping to the clearings, there's a big 
tree. It stands alone, proudly, as if there is something different about it. A forest, by definition, is a large group of trees. But this one didn't feel like part of it. It was a tree in a forest, yes, but it was not a part of the forest it resided in. This was its own thing. It was special. It quickly became our go-to spot. And one day, we marked it as our own by carving our initials into the bark. W. E. Emily went missing in those same woods just a few days later. It was our last time together. I think about it a lot. I was 12 at the time. My parents didn't let me join in the local search parties. They told me I'd be scared. I convinced them to let me join just once, and my reaction to what I saw seemed to prove them right. They thought it was a sign of my trauma, but it wasn't. It was the cause. The big tree was gone. Where our initials once etched into a monument of nature itself, was now nothing. Emptiness. Of course, nobody knew the woods like me and Emily. Trees don't move, everyone told me. You're scared. It's okay, we all are, but trees don't move. It only took me 14 years to prove them wrong. The woods began their creeping a little over a month ago. I was getting ready for bed, yet as my glance fell over the window, I noticed a tree over the fence, one that was not there before. The first tree to take a midnight walk, at least the first I had noticed in over a decade. I found myself watching expectantly, but expectant of what I'm not sure. I thought maybe I could catch it moving, morphing in the moonlit nighttime air, but it just stood there, staring back at me. Make no mistake. This tree was staring. No eyes to see, but staring all the same. It felt like it wasn't a part of the forest. A tree in a forest that it does not belong to is a curious thought to some, but a feeling I'm used to. Every night, when I went to bed, I would look out the window. More and more trees from the forest seemed to inch closer to my property. Each time, they stopped feeling like a part of the woods. Their membership to that club ends the moment they begin to move. They are their own collective once they do that. I didn't tell anyone. I wasn't even sure what to say. People thought I was crazy for implying that trees move as a child. Imagine what they'd think if I said it now. But a fact not spoken is a fact all the same. There is a horrifying thing one learns about forests when they begin to shift. They make noise. I wish I could say it was simply a rustling or creaking as they reroute to their new location. That would almost be peaceful. 
They make noises that get burnt into your brain. They screech. They roar. They groan in pain. Their loud whispers whimper through the air every night, reminding us that they are on the move. Their mournful lullaby does everything but help me sleep. They distill a fear in me that I haven't truly felt for 14 years. I knew this was connected to Emily's disappearance all that time ago. I'm not the only one that hears the noises. Although, I'm the only one who truly listens to their meaning. Many of my neighbors have put their houses up for sale already, because they cannot stand the nightly symphony of nature. That's what they call it. Nature. Nothing about this is natural. I knew the trees were specifically targeting me after just a week. Nobody else had trees at their window, except me. Once at my home, at the edge of what I call my own, they stopped getting closer. They moved every night, continuing their echoes. But they did not break through my walls to reach me. The gentle tapping of branches upon my window had an eerie rhythm to them, as if someone were knocking, asking to be let in. I could almost feel their roots below the ground, beating like veins in flesh. It only took two nights of that before I decided to chop the branches. I knew they'd just grow back or move to a new position, but I needed to try it. That's when I discovered why the expansion of our town was cancelled. Blood dripped from the branches as I cut them. This was not sap. This was red, oozing blood. It smelt metallic, and groans could be heard from deep within the forest with every chop of my tools. I had become the conductor of this symphony. For every chop, a loud, horrific screech echoed throughout the woods. It only took five before I couldn't continue. You may have noticed that I haven't referred to it as Inwoods for a while. That's because, as far as I'm concerned, this is no longer Inwoods. There is not a single tree that remained in its spot. They have all chosen to disconnect themselves from Inwoods by moving inwards towards our town and my life. I'd considered selling with my neighbors, but despite all the new questions I had, this was the closest I had ever come to answering Emily's disappearance. Last week, I had a dream. I hadn't dreamt in a while, or even slept much for that matter. I dreamt of Emily, now as an adult, playing among the trees. We had gone into the woods together to remind ourselves of our childhood. Isn't this fun? Emily spoke with an unclear voice in this dream, almost groans, but I could still understand her. This is, I said, vaguely aware of the real world, acutely knowing that I was sleeping. I just wish you could really be here. Perhaps I never left. 
Perhaps I've been trying to find my way back to you. We stared at each other before she spoke again. Perhaps you can join me. I jolted awake to the sound of tapping at my window and the distant choir of the forest. Yet, something about this tapping felt different. Almost more excited than usual. It scraped along my window after each one, as if no longer asking to come in, but instead to invite me outside. I peeked through the window. Many of the trees had moved away from my home. Only one was right outside. I was still tired and my vision felt crooked. But I could clearly make out the letters engraved into the bark. W. E. For a second, I felt calm. I felt the fear of the past 14 years drift away. Emily? I spoke aloud. The forest responded with whispers that felt more gentle this time. I made my way downstairs and out the back of the house. I walked right up to the big tree and placed my hand over the initials. For just a moment, there was peace. The groans stopped as did the tapping of the window. I felt a pressure tightening in my hand at the surface of my palm and fingertips. The creaking sound came not from the forest, but from this very spot on the big tree. It was growing around my hand. It wanted me to join it, it wanted me to become part of the woods, my veins tangling with the roots, my thoughts tangling with the leaves. I pulled away, bits of skin tearing from the outer layers of my hand. The pain I felt was shared. The creaking returned to the forest, louder than I had ever heard it. The forest is not Emily. Emily would not have put me in a position like that. She would not ask me to give up my life to become something I am not. I believe the woods have tangled with Emily's memories. That which she was fond of is now what the trees are fond of. Pieces of her mind scattered across Inwoods the day she vanished. But her soul is not there. A collective network of trees have been given the gift of thought. And it is terrifying. Did you check the key bowl? My girlfriend's question tells you everything you need to know about how often I lose things. Yes, obviously I checked the key bowl. The lie of my response tells you how confidently wrong I always am. In this instance, the keys were indeed in the key bowl. Found them. I tried to speak in a tone that didn't make it immediately obvious how stupid I was. Where were they? I had two options. Tell her where I found them, and let her hold this victory over me, or be more subtle about it and keep my pride. I chose the former. I'm not a liar. Other than earlier on, when I lied about checking the key bowl, that was different. She giggled. 
I'm not even looking for them, and I find them better than you do. She was right. I constantly misplace things. Sometimes they're found. But, quite often, I never see them again. Lost into the void. As I'd always say, she had a much more rational belief. That I'm just a bit of an idiot at times. It made more sense than the idea that something was out there to get me. Out to cause me an inconvenience. Of course, I never actually believed that my missing items were a result of anything other than my own ignorance. It was just a fun and somewhat comforting idea. That it somehow wasn't my fault. Sometimes, I still wonder if it's my fault that she disappeared. Last year, my girlfriend went missing. We went to bed together. And in the morning, the bed was unbearably empty. The lack of her presence became immediately obvious to me. The blanket lay undisturbed, with her phone still on the side. I headed to the bathroom, the only logical place for her to be, to find nothing. The lights in the house, all off, suggesting that nobody was here except me. Babe? I yelled, the only response being silence. I remember the exact moment that a pit seemed to form in my stomach as I tried to cling on to rational thoughts. Maybe she was just outside, taking out trash. Or maybe she had to go to the shops, simply for getting her phone at home. This could all be a funny story in a few minutes' time. Rational thoughts aren't always correct, as comforting as that would be. She had vanished. There's no two ways around it. She was gone. The weeks after that were long and difficult. It hasn't gotten any easier. Sometimes I wonder what I missed when I was asleep. Was she taken? Did she hold a secret hatred to me, and left silently, leaving her life behind? Could I have stopped whatever happened if I was just awake? Her birthday was last week. I think about her every morning. Every single morning. I wake up to the same cold, empty bed that I did last year. But on this particular morning, the thoughts of her clung to me stronger than usual. The intense feeling of needing her by my side boiled up into a complex mix of emotions. For the longest time, I didn't want to open my eyes for just a little longer. I wanted to pretend she was there, next to me. Eventually, I began the same routine I do every day. I open my eyes, turn to the empty space next to me, and reach out to confirm that it's real. But instead, I was interrupted. Not by a sound or a person, but an object. One that didn't exist the night prior, as I climbed into bed and struggled to fall asleep. At first, the unfamiliarity caused confusion. If you're not expecting to see a vending machine in your bedroom, you don't see a vending machine in your bedroom. For a moment, you just see a large box. 
an out-of-place shape in your room of comfort. It takes a moment for your mind to collect together the context. The white glowing buttons along the right-hand side. The wide metallic collection door at the bottom. The gentle hum of electronics inside. This rectangle suddenly became something tangible. Something I understood to exist. There was a vending machine in my bedroom. I stood up slowly, trying to explain this away in my head. I knew I wasn't dreaming. My girlfriend is always with me in my dreams. So how had this gotten here without me hearing it? Who had broken in to leave this? It would have hardly even fit through the door, at least not without a lot of noise. The machine itself was matte black all over. A few dozen blank buttons sat on the right. No glass allowed my gaze inside, and no branding allowed my mind any understanding of the contents. In place of the glass, taking up any space on the front that lacked buttons, words were printed in a white modern font. Lost and found. I don't know why, but I spoke aloud for a moment. I miss you. As if this machine were a conduit to her. But do you really blame me? It had appeared just as mysteriously as she had gone. On her birthday, of all days, too. My mind connected the two, thinking for just a moment that perhaps she had left this for me. I stepped towards the appliance, taking it all in. It stood just a little taller than me. I reached out, feeling its smooth, cold surface. My fingers found their way over the lettering, as a small bump told me they were slightly recessed. Eventually, my hand lay over the buttons. Without too much thought, I pressed a button. The light of it dimmed, whilst the others still remained active. A whirring from within the machine told me that if I waited, something would dispense. As the sound stopped, a clink from below suggested it was complete. I reached into the collection area and pulled out a small silver analog watch. It took a moment for my thoughts to catch up. I had lost this same watch years ago, on holiday. It was a gift from my brother, who wasn't particularly happy with me for losing it. Whilst the inexplicable, unexplainable nature of this bothered me, I was happy to be holding it again. For the first time in a year... I found myself genuinely smiling. Curiously, I pressed another button. Now, two were dim, with maybe forty or so still active. The whirring sounded the same, yet the clink had become a thump. Reaching in, I took out my childhood diary. I had lost it when I was seven. I was slightly surprised I even still recognized it. However, I was more surprised at the pristine condition. Turning through the pages, reading some of the entries, some of them even still had eraser shavings where I had taken out mistakes. It was as if it hadn't aged even a day. The third button gave me my old wallet. The next gave me a teddy I don't even remember holding, but recognized from my baby photos. Somewhere along the line, all the money I had ever lost spilt out onto the floor. I even got back a phone I had lost, somehow not smashing as it fell down through the machine. 
With another press, it dispensed her necklace. I stood there, holding it in a beautiful moment, holding something of hers, something she loved, for the first time in a year. Right there, I felt more connected to her than ever before. I held it tight as I took a short time to look around. Everything I had ever lost was with me again. I just wished she could have been there to witness this. But perhaps she was somehow responsible. It brought me comfort to imagine that somehow, from wherever she may be, she's still helping me find things. Irrational as it may have been, it's a nice thought. Rational thoughts aren't always correct, but neither are irrational ones. With another press, the machine came to life for the final time. As the last button dimmed away, it seemed to whir for longer than usual. I took a moment to reflect on the necklace again. She had been wearing it the night she disappeared. I wasn't sure anymore if that made it more special or more eerie. Should that have brought me comfort or have been a warning? Something dropped into the collection area. Yet the machine continued to whir. Another drop. And another. And another. It didn't sound consistent. Some thumped, while others did not. I waited for the sounds to subside before reaching in. Once I finally did get to put my hand inside, it felt wet. I don't remember whether I pulled out her finger or her ear first. I just remember that her finger still wore her favorite ring. It's all a blur. My hand, covered in blood. I opened the collection door slightly wider to peer inside. A collection of flesh, bones, and skin. Some mangled together. Some kept pristine. There's no way I can prove all of it is even her. Most of it, a mess. Unrecognizable as ever being a living, breathing person. I screamed as I mashed the buttons again. A rational person wouldn't have done this, but I was not a rational person. Did I expect these actions to be undone? The deafening silence seemed to fill the room. The machine was unresponsive. I fell back onto the bed, soaking the sheets with blood. With the ring and the necklace I had previously clutched, the situation lacked the magic it had held moments prior. The horror seeped in. As I looked around for anything to offer solace, the lost items on the floor, now covered in blood, served only as a reminder that I was forbidden for my happy ending. The ring, still attached to the finger, burned into my mind. Was this a message? A warning? Was there any explanation at all? My gaze met with a photo, framed by the side of my bed. It was of us, full of life. We took it on the day of her last birthday, oblivious to what was to come. She wore the same necklace and ring. We were happy. How much I wished to go back to a simpler time. Rational thoughts aren't always correct. But neither are irrational ones. 
only the truth remains constant, even when unexplainable and rarely comforting. Every tree in all the forests on earth, every grain of sand on the beach, every drop in the ocean, none of these even come close to infinity. If you think you have comprehended how big that is, you are wrong. Nothing can be compared to the endless number and nothing will ever allow any of us to truly understand it. But I'm willing to bet I'm the closest to it. I am not from this universe. The multiverse is the best example of infinity, and I have traveled across it more times than I could possibly count. Yet, even my travels do not come close to the colossal giant of Unlimited. I invented multiverse travel. Perhaps I should have set limits before toying with something so limitless. At first, it was amazing. More than that, it was like experiencing a miracle. Up until the very moment I successfully traveled, it was purely theoretical. Proving that it worked in practice changed everything. I was not alone when I pressed the button on that device, but I was once I let go of it. I was in the kitchen, and my family watched as I used it and presumably saw me disappear. At the time, the device had no proper way of navigating the multiverse or keeping a history of previous destinations. So, my original universe has been lost in the boundless flow of everything. My original family probably still thinks they saw me die that day. After the transport, Things immediately felt different in that room. Small things that you'd never truly notice. But after living there for so long, I think my subconscious knew. The paint strokes on the wall in slightly different directions than before. The tiles of the floor seeming slightly colder than usual. The marble pattern on the countertops just seeming off. I was seeing something so very familiar, yet not what I knew. The bigger picture hadn't changed, but every tiny detail making it up had. I avoided finding myself. I left the house as soon as possible and explored the new world. Nothing was substantially new, and I wanted to experience more. So, I kept pressing the button. That first week or so had me switching universes at least 20 times a day. It turns out that about half of them don't contain any life. But that's still an infinite amount. 50% of the endlessness is still endless. It only took me a few weeks before I wanted to find another me and speak to them. The times I did were wonderful at first. Experiencing myself from a third-person perspective is something I could hardly wrap my head around, and neither could me, the other me. As selfish as it sounds, meeting myself for the first time is a fond memory I have. 
That was 25 years ago. Since then, I have visited realities where our technology has become so much more advanced. They taught me a lot. I've seen Earths with three moons. I've witnessed the globe after an apocalypse. And I've experienced a world where humans were not the dominant species. I have done everything twice. And to be honest, I grew tired of it. When you have every possible scenario in the palm of your hand, what's the point? Every insect on every tree in all the forests on earth, every possible arrangement of every grain of sand on the beach, every single molecule of every drop in the ocean multiplied by a billion, None of those numbers even come close to the infinity that this device could reach. When you know that your life is one in infinity, you have mathematically and scientifically proven yourself to be nothing. Zero. The first time the multiverse truly scared me is not on any of the near-death experiences I've had in my journeys. It's when I first found a universe in which I never existed. Nobody knew or cared. My family, my friends, my colleagues. They were all just as happy if a puzzle piece is not even a requirement to finish the puzzle, why include it in the box? I've done things I'm not proud of. When I say I've done everything twice, I mean everything. The good and the bad. I've caused extinctions on entire Earths just for fun. The overall number of living beings in the multiverse is always infinite. So, do deaths even count? Murdering 8 million people sounds like a lot. But compared to the infinite that is left and always will be left, it's not even a drop in the ocean. Actions have no consequences when you have seen the boundless infinity. I have killed you before. Don't feel so down about that, though. Those people are still alive in every other universe. You're still alive in this one. Those actions had a net loss of nothing. I'm not evil. Given infinite possibilities, everyone would eventually do everything. It's just a game of probabilities at that point. You would do it, too. There was a time when I wished I could still be surprised. And that time was only a few days ago. But I may have wished too hard. Because for the first time since I started my travels... I am experiencing something new. In hindsight, it was obvious that something like this would happen eventually, but it simply never crossed my mind. I met another me. This in itself wasn't a surprise. I had met myself all the time. But this me was different. He had also discovered multiverse travel. He had been traveling for about as long as I had, and was growing just as bored with the same old new. I don't know what's less likely. Bumping into each other, 
or not having bumped into each other sooner. We shared our experiences, and although neither of us had done anything the other hadn't, it felt nice that someone could truly understand how alone and insignificant I felt amongst it all. You can imagine my interest when he told me he had a plan that would allow us to truly experience something new. I jokingly said, Well, the only thing we haven't tried. He knew the end of the sentence is death. <laughs> exactly. We both laughed. Is that your plan? He smiled as he clarified. We both think the same way. You know that's not my plan. Because if it were... I finished his sentence. It would be a bad plan. Because even death is insignificant. We exchanged a melancholy smile. A face I'm used to pulling, but not seeing. He broke the silence. It's a bit bigger than that. I'm thinking something like the death of everyone. I was confused at first. Like taking this entire universe out with us in it? What's even the difference? There's still infinite other universes left. It'd still equate to nothing, mathematically. No, my dearest me. I mean everyone. Taking out the multiverse. My emotions word to life for the first time in decades. I felt dread. Terror. Fear. The multiverse? I asked with an almost shaky voice. Feeling such a primal emotion felt strange. Almost new. Death doesn't scare me. Not now that I've experienced it all. But the idea of nothing existing... That's something worth being frightened over. Exactly. Here, I've got it all planned out. He handed me multiple sketches. Plans to alter our devices in a way that wouldn't pull the user through the multiverse. But instead, pull reality apart. Not just nearby, but across every single universe. It required both of our device's parts to succeed. I've run the numbers again and again. I've found no faults. You can't be serious. As I said, we both think alike. You know I'm serious. I do not think like you. This isn't a plan. This is an ending. Well, perhaps when the author refuses to write an ending, someone needs to step in and force it. It was only at this point that I realized just because someone is genetically you it will never make them you. The only me is me. There is only one of me. There is only one of you. The infinite number of us across the multiverse are identical in every way, but they are not us. Only you will ever get the true privilege of being you. He spoke again. It's all or nothing. 
you know what it's like. Ending one life. A million lives. A trillion lives. All total to nothing. The only way to get anything greater than zero is to go for everything. There are two options here. Insignificance or the total end of it all. And I'm sick of living the former. A single death is not insignificant. It... You spoke it yourself, did you not? It began to dawn on me all the horrific acts I've committed in my search for new things to do. Yes, but that was then. This is now. He knew I wasn't going to help him. Truthfully, I think he knew that from the beginning. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a device. He did this whilst already holding his own in his other hand. I hastily reached into my own pocket to confirm what I already knew. As my pocket was empty... I'm sorry we couldn't see eye to eye. With that, he pressed a button and was gone. He left me stranded in this universe. Your universe. Needless to say, we're still alive. I just don't know if that's going to last. Maybe someone stopped him. Maybe he just hasn't activated it yet. I cannot predict what is going to happen. And that terrifies me almost as much as his plan itself. It's not a feeling I'm used to anymore. Maybe nothing will happen. I hope nothing will happen. But... I felt it my duty to inform you. So if you see on the news that something at the distant edge of our galaxy is rapidly moving toward us, at least you'll know what it is. It's the end of everything. Ripping apart everything in its path. Everyone in the other universes will have no idea what's headed for them. Only this one will. A one in infinity chance. Zero percent odds of this universe being the one to find out. And yet, here we are. Maybe that does make this one Significant after all. Cliff and I have been playing the same game of tag for over 15 years now. It's just a dumb kid's game. Yet... I'm terrified for my life. It began the summer before secondary school. Cliff had just moved to Sheffield, a few streets from my house. I saw him at the park a few times by himself. One day, he simply walked over and asked if I wanted to play a game of tag. I agreed, and we've stayed friends ever since. All through our teenage years, the gap year, and university, we've kept this game of tag bubbling between us. Why? I could never muster a satisfying answer. I guess we were both competitive people. We liked to win, and nobody lost as long as the game kept going. 
After university, I had to move to London to chase my dreams of being a cinematographer. Cliff was staying put. He had a life here now. He'd been seeing Olivia for a couple of years by that point, and things were getting serious. During our farewell, he hugged me close before tapping me on the shoulder. Tag, you're it. He whispered. We promised to see each other every few weeks, but life got in the way, like it always does. My career, semi took off, and Cliff started a family with Olivia, giving birth to their first child, Rosie. The game became an excuse to visit each other for our birthdays. We'd surprise the birthday boy by turning up unannounced and tagging them. This went on for many years, the element of surprise fading into the background. It was simply an excuse to keep our friendship alive. A few years back, I'd had some time off between projects without much to do. I hadn't heard from Cliff for a while, so I decided to genuinely surprise him for his birthday. The plan? Turning up on his doorstep a week early, tagging him, and then demanding we go out and get drunk. I packed up my camper van and drove to Sheffield. It felt like the perfect plan, but it turned out to be the worst decision of my life. It was 8 p.m. by the time I parked up outside of Cliff's house. The place was dark, but Cliff's car was parked in the driveway. I watched the house for a few minutes to see if anyone was home. A figure walked by one of the bay windows of the living room, still shrouded in darkness. Somebody was home. I crept up the drive and went to knock on the door. Just as my knuckles were about to strike, Cliff appeared in the doorway, dressed as if he was about to head out. From his expression, he was just as surprised as I was. What the hell? He said, his expression frozen in stern shock. I threw my hands up and smiled. Surprise! He didn't say anything for a while. He just stared at me, his mouth forming into a slight grimace. I slowly leaned forward, extended my finger, and jabbed him in the chest. Tag, you're it. I said, Does Olivia know you're coming? No, but you can't just drop in like this. He said, that's why I brought my camper van. I'll sleep in there tonight. I just want a couple of beers. Let me talk to Olivia. I'm sure I can convince her. I said. Cliff shook his head and yanked the front door closed with some force. She's taking Rosie to see her mom for the weekend. Her grandpa's on his last legs. Sorry to hear that. I said waiting for the appropriate amount of time before speaking again. But am I right in thinking that means you're free tonight? I gave him my best shit-eating grin. Cliff looked back at the door, then at me. He kicked some mud off of his shoe like a bashful child. Fine. A couple of pints. No more. I've got a busy day tomorrow. He said. After six beers, Cliff was in a much better mood. He seemed more relaxed than I'd seen him in years. I knew his job was tough. Something complicated with finance. Great pay, but terrible work-life balance. And raising a kid can't be easy. But now, he was cracking jokes, buying tequila shots, 
and even sneaking a few cheeky cigarettes from me. It felt like we were teenagers again, just two best friends enjoying each other's company. Cliff came stumbling back to the table, two pints sloshing in his hands. He slumped into the stool next to me and slapped me on the back. You really got me, man. He slurred. I wrapped my arm around his shoulder. I always was the better player. I said. That always used to wind him up. He smiled at me like a banshee, all teeth and gums. I'm gonna get you when you least expect it. He said, his tone almost musical. It took us twice the time to get home, with multiple sick and piss stops along the way. Our conversation dwindled as we eventually arrived at his house. I unlocked the camper van and went to step in. You can come in if you want, he said, the first words he'd spoken in the last ten minutes. His tone was desperate, like the lonely kid I met on the playing field all those years ago. My vision was spinning like a merry-go-round. I don't think I'll make it. I need to sleep. Sir? He asked. I nodded, causing a sharp pain behind my right eye. The hangover headaches were already creeping across my skull. He was working the next day, so I promised not to disturb him. I had a long drive back anyway, and needed a few pit stops to pick up snacks and question my life choices before getting home. We hugged goodbye, and he squeezed me tight. I thought I was going to be sick. A week later... I thought I would be sick again, but for a very different reason. Back at home, I was prepping for a shot when the police called. Did I know I'd spent the night with a murderer? Cliff had stabbed Olivia and Rosie the morning before I visited. One minute, he was having breakfast with his family. The next, he was puncturing holes into both of them with a fillet knife. Their blood was still oozing over the kitchen tiles by the time I arrived just a few hours later. He'd left them to rot there while we got drunk together. The police almost seemed delighted to talk to me, certain that I could shed some light on the case. That certainly was quickly replaced with mild shock and deep frustration as I told them we'd spent the whole night together and that I'd noticed absolutely nothing. Cliff seemed fine. Better than fine. He seemed great. There was no motive, no suspects, and no leads. One thing was for certain. They'd been a happy family. No evidence of secret affairs or hidden debts. It was like Cliff simply decided to detonate the life he'd spent so long building. I loved Olivia and Rosie, and now they'd been wiped from the planet by someone I'd called my best friend. I spent the next few weeks in a daze, replaying the night endlessly in my mind, searching for clues to what had happened to my friend of 15 years. You'd think all that time with someone would mean that you'd get a grasp on what kind of person they are. What a joke. We all wear masks. But some are hiding uglier faces than others. So much of the night was a blur. It was hard to piece it all together. 
But there was one moment that I couldn't shake. I'm gonna get you when you least expect it. Was Cliff still playing tag with me? The police said he'd gone into hiding somewhere in the Peak District. They were searching high and low, but they hadn't found a clue yet. He'd packed nothing and left on foot. The lead officer believed he'd gone out into the woods to die, that we'd find his body washed up in a ditch somewhere. I knew better. If there was still a hint of the old cliff out there, he'd be plotting to get me back. He never liked to lose. And while he was it, he was losing. Months went by, and still, nobody knew where Cliff had gone. I knew he hadn't gone far. He was out there, creeping along the peripheries of my vision, waiting for the best opportunity to strike. I shed friends and jobs like a dying snake. I couldn't leave the house, knowing there was a chance he was still out there. He'd appear in busy crowds, smiling just like he did when I saw him after he murdered his family. Sometimes the crowds would part, and I'd realize it wasn't Cliff. Other times, his features, now gaunt and wild, remained unchanged. One night, I was in my office reviewing some footage for a new film I was working on. I looked out my window, and there he was, crouched by my shed, obscured by shadows. I told myself it was just a trick of my mind, but then I saw his face, pale white and illuminated by the full moon. He was smiling. I grabbed my phone off the desk and called the police, but by the time they picked up, he was gone. Months turned to years and Cliff still hadn't been found. Police had uncovered some human remains in a cave a few miles outside of Sheffield, but hadn't been able to identify who it was or how long they'd been there. Interest in the story dwindled, and everyone moved on to the next violent atrocity. Even I had stopped seeing him so much, except for the occasional nightmare. My bank account had dried up, and I needed to find work. I spent the last of my savings on a therapist to untangle me from the web of shame and paranoia that kept me trapped inside my house. Questions still plagued me. How was I meant to trust someone again? Do we ever really know the people we love? What made Cliff do what he did? I came to accept that I would never find out the answers. After many long and painful sessions, I finally started to feel like a shell of a normal human. I was able to leave my house, look people in the eye, and begin to rebuild my life. But the guilt never left. Even after all the pain I'd been through, at least I was still alive. That's more than can be said about Olivia. And... Rosie. I'd celebrated with the man who wiped them from this world and spent the night sleeping next to their corpses. I needed to move on from this nightmare. And the only way to do that was to say a final goodbye. I packed up my camper van and headed to Sheffield, to the cemetery where they were both 
buried. It was a cold, bitter winter morning. The wind tugged at my hair and clothes as I marched along the endless rows of crumbling graves, desperately searching for Olivia and Rosie. I eventually found them, tucked away in a quiet corner underneath a great oak tree. The wind screamed through its branches, creating a ceaseless white noise. I tried concentrating on the names carved on the graves, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My heart was racing. Why had I come here? A branch snapped behind me. I spun around. It was a squirrel watching me from a few rows along. It cocked its head at me before running as fast as it could in the other direction. There wasn't another soul in the entire cemetery. I was utterly alone. I took a deep breath and looked back at the names, Olivia and Rosie. I said I was sorry and replaced the crusted remains of some old flowers with fresh daffodils I'd bought. Clearly, nobody had visited them in a long time. Something deep in my gut told me that Cliff was gone. He'd lost his mind and starved to death in the middle of some woods. The end of an unexplainable tragedy. I said goodbye to all three of them that day and drove home. But sometimes, your gut instinct can be wrong. So very, very wrong. Last week, I was at a house party against my will. My new-ish girlfriend had dragged me there and told me it would be fun. It was anything but. I'd necked a bottle of wine in less than an hour, and the queue to the toilet was four people deep. My bladder isn't what it used to be, so I snuck out into the garden to find a secluded spot. As I stepped outside, the floodlight illuminated the garden in a stark white. I crept to a shadowy corner. After a few seconds, the garden turned black as the floodlight switched off. For a while, all I could hear was the sound of my own piss. Then I heard the pattering of feet behind me. They were rushing at full pace. The floodlight switched back on. I spun around. A naked figure was running across the garden towards me. It was Cliff. And he was coming fast. His body lean and muscular like an animal. His skin was smeared in dirt and muck. Some old, some new. With a long, scrappy beard and greasy hair. He grinned at me with missing teeth. His thick right arm was outstretched. His dark eyes glinted in the moonlight. Five giant fingers stabbed my chest, sending a jolt of sharp pain across my ribs. The force pushed me back up against the garden fence. I tried to let out a scream, but it got caught in my throat. Cliff put his face up close to mine, his rotten breath stinging my nostrils. Dag, you're it. He leant across me and took a deep breath by my neck, as if savoring my scent for the final time. Then he leapt back and ran across the garden at a horrific speed. Disappearing over the garden fence, I whimpered as I slid down the fence, trying to hold back tears. 
nobody believes me. Not even the police. I can't lose more years of my life hiding away in my house. I need to take control. Cliff is out there. Alive. Not only that, he's winning at tag. I can't let that murdering piece of shit win. I've got to hunt him down for Olivia and... Rosie. Screw it. For me, too. I'm going to find him. And I'm going... to end this game once and for all. As a child, I'd call it the flicker. There's one in all of us, glowing and glimmering in the most beautiful way. No two are exactly the same. Each is unique to the person. They move like fire and shine like stars. I can recognize someone before they even enter the room as I see their energy dancing through the walls. The only person I ever spoke to about this was my grandpa. I'd see him every day after school, since my mother would still be at work. We'd talk for hours about everything, but I'd often bring the conversation back to the flickers. It never confused him. We just spoke about it like it was normal. He would smile and listen to my stories, and I'd smile whilst telling them. I loved the way he would ask me questions and show a genuine interest. I always looked forward to finishing school so I could see him. Something my grandpa was known for was giving advice you didn't ask for. You always needed it, though, even if you didn't realize it. There's one particular piece of advice that has always stuck with me. Stay clear of graveyards. A soul of the dead was left here for a reason. He always believed that the flickers were souls. Although I never thought the same, until recently. I reminded him that I had only seen the flicker inside of living people. But he already knew. He told me that I should be prepared for if things ever change. I loved him so much. He always thought about how things change and always had a plan for if they did. I miss him. I was there when he passed away last month. He had been sick for a few weeks, going in and out of the hospital, but he never let it change him. Right until the last day, he was always his usual self, making us laugh, talking nonstop, and giving advice. He had a wisdom-esque charm about him. Like he always knew more than you realized. His gift was being able to prepare anyone for anything. The one thing he could prepare nobody for was his death. We all knew it would happen eventually, and we were all by his side when it did. He didn't say much in his final few hours, but right before he closed his eyes for the final time, he looked at me with confidence. It was as if he wanted to pass his confidence on to me before going. The hardest part, and the part that cemented my belief in the flickers being souls, was watching his disappear. 
It didn't happen fast. This was not akin to a candle being blown out. It shrunk slowly as it got faintly dimmer by the second. It was like a flame burning to the end of its wick. Finishing a life fully lived. It was about the only thing that gave me comfort at the time. Knowing that his fire burnt out rather than being extinguished. Over the past month, my connection to the flickers has diminished. It happened slowly at first. I would notice them getting fainter every day. Yesterday, I looked in the mirror and saw no flicker at all. No flame through the walls. No glowing on the streets. I could no longer see them. I could no longer feel them. I felt lonely, as if I could no longer truly connect with anyone. Nobody even knew it, but I was going through another loss. I did something I thought I would never do. I visited a graveyard. I had to see my grandpa's grave. I made my way down that night. It was completely empty, not a person in sight. I'm not just saying that because I couldn't see any souls. I thought that was the case, too. But then I had a proper look. And I truly was alone. As I approached my grandpa's grave, I looked longingly at the stone and the dirt. It was hard to believe he was really gone. Hey, the flickers are all gone. I can't see them anymore. I paused, as if waiting for a response. None came. I don't know what it means, but I wanted you to know. I paused again. It happened around the time you... around the time you left. I wanted to... Oh, God. My speech broke as I started to tear up. I didn't know what I was doing there, and I felt like going had been a stupid idea. Just then... As my silent cry grew into a loud one, I noticed a faint glowing in the ground of a nearby grave. Then two. Then four. Then more. The dirt all began to light up with flickers beneath. Many graves remained dark, my grandpa's included. Yet many were shining bright. The flickers floated gently into the air, eye level with me. There were easily a hundred of them, probably more. Each began to circle around me. Their gentle glows were so beautiful, and I felt that they could sense my connection. They knew I could see them, they shone differently to living souls, slightly darker. Their flames flickered and danced more than I was used to. I should have listened to my grandpa, but I realized it all too late. My eyes were too busy watching their movements to realize that a flicker had moved into my head from behind. I noticed my mind become fuzzy, as if I could hear the soul's own thoughts. We made your grandpa sick. The sentence was so disgusting, I almost couldn't process it at first. We can do 
the same to you. I fell to the floor, causing the flicker to leave my head. I could think clearly again, and I noticed they had all stopped moving. They were just waiting to find out what I would do. Whilst linked with that flicker, I could almost feel their wants and motives. They wanted to control my body, to use me. I don't know what for, but I could feel that they wanted my mind empty to use it for themselves. I was just a vessel for them to get control of. Is this why they killed my grandpa? To have access to a vacant body? I ran away, leaving the graveyard behind. They didn't seem to follow me. I can only assume that they have to stay close to their physical body. I passed a few people as I ran through the streets, each still without a flicker. I could not see living flickers anymore, only those of the dead. I'm so used to identifying people by their souls that I almost bumped into people several times. I couldn't go home after that. I needed to sit with someone I trusted, so I went to my mother's place. My plan was to gently open up to her about my ability and tell her everything. Once I got there, I knocked on the door. But in all the panic, it took me a moment to notice that I could see a flicker through the wall. It came closer. As I heard the lock turn and watched the door open, my mother was standing there, the glow coming from within her. She spoke. Didn't we tell you what we can do to you? We stared at each other expectantly. They were waiting for my reaction, but I didn't have one. I was frozen, locked up with fear, unable to react. Your mother was kind enough to drop by her dad's grave earlier. Isn't that nice? I let my anger show through my fear. Get out now! As my passion for protecting my mother rose, I noticed a second glow inside of her. Looking down, my own flicker had also returned. I could see them through all the houses on the street. These were living flickers. They shone like stars. I stared at my mother's. It was as bright as always, yet ever so small. The flicker of the dead was seemingly extinguishing what was left of my mother. I felt a burning deep inside of me. Noticing my own flame, larger than ever, I watched as it slowly left my body and grew closer to my mother's soul. They danced and intertwined, sharing their strength, igniting each other. Her fire grew stronger until it had fully engulfed the dead flicker possessing her. She collapsed to the floor. As my own soul returned to me, I could see clearly that the soul inside of her was once again her own. Her own flicker, shining bright, told me that she was alive. I got her into bed and sat downstairs. I questioned to myself whether my ability is a gift or a curse. All I knew is that I wanted to ask my grandpa. He would know what to do. Just then, my phone rang. Grandpa? The 
the news said everything would be fine. Most of my friends were being encouraged to still go into work. We'd had a much worse hurricane just the month before. So why? Just why? Was Waffle House closed? It must have meant something bad was coming. Something terrible. Waffle House stays open through anything. I've seen those doors wide open in far worse conditions. If there are patrons around, they will sell to them. No questions asked. It's how things have always been. At that moment, I knew only two things. One, I had to get out of there. Two, I needed to get to the bottom of this. So, I did what any sane person would. I tracked down the manager of my local Waffle House and went straight to his home address. He lived about a ten minute drive away, in the next town over. There were still many other cars on the road at this time. All that kept racing through my head was why would Waffle House be closed? The hurricane wasn't for another few hours. If drivers could be out, Waffle House could stay open. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen them closed before this. Do their doors even have locks? I pulled up at the house. There was already a car in the driveway, so I just pulled up onto the sidewalk. I got out of my car and walked up to the door. I knocked. Three stern, demanding knocks. Not a movement inside. This was definitely the right house. So, I knocked again. Three sterner, even more demanding knocks. Still nothing. I walked up to the window and peered in. A chair was knocked over. Breakfast was getting cold on the table. I could see the kitchen sink through an open door at the back of the room. The sink was overflowing with water, and the faucet left on. I walked slowly back to my car. What could have made everyone leave so fast? And without their car? I sat down, defeated. I had come for answers, but only collected more questions. To clear my head, I turned on the radio, and what blasted out of the speakers is etched in my mind. Breaking news. All 2,100 Waffle Houses have decided to close today. The only words I could muster up were, my God. The first thought I had was, well, wow, that's a lot of locations. Is there really that many? That seems like a lot. But then my second thought was about how dire this must be. All Waffle Houses. Whatever was going on was not a localized problem. This was national, maybe even global. That's when I spotted a black car with tinted windows at the end of the road. I decided to follow them in hopes that I just caught the family as they left the house. I saw them disappear around the corner and immediately started driving. No other cars were around at the time, so I knew I had to be discreet as my presence would be obvious. But when I turned the corner, the car was just stopped in the middle of the road, as if waiting for me. I slowed down to a stop, and their back left door opened. A man in a suit stepped out. As soon as his face was visible, I recognized him. This was the manager I had been looking for. I felt my stomach drop a little as he approached the driver's seat window and waited for me 
to roll it down. He peered at me through the glass with calculating eyes, as if he already knew me. I rolled down the window. He spoke up. You're wondering how I knew you'd follow me, aren't you, Jeremy? I probably looked terrified at this point. I felt myself go pale, but tried to keep my composure. You, you know my name? I know lots of things. Your name is just one. But you should probably leave, Jeremy. Things aren't safe in most of America. He began to walk away, but as soon as I opened my mouth to talk, he stopped. Not a sound had left my lips yet, but somehow, without even so much as glancing back at me, he knew I was about to speak. Not safe? What do you mean? He stood for a moment, as if he was thinking. I'm not entirely sure why, as he seemed to know everything that was going to happen up to this point. But then he spoke, without looking at me. As a manager of a Waffle House, I'm granted special knowledge every morning. I'm told what will happen throughout my day. Not tomorrow, not next week. Every morning, I am only informed about the current day. He turned back at me now and continued. I'm told how safe my restaurant will be, how safe my staff will be, and how safe my family will be. I don't know who tells me these things. No manager does. We just know. It's always through a phone call, and it's always correct. I caught my breath, not even realizing it had sped up, and replied, And your family isn't safe today? They are not. And it sounds like no family is. What's causing it? What's going to happen? He looked a little scared, maybe sad. He had a way of hiding his emotions behind his cold, serious tone. I've told you everything I know. I also know that this is the end of this conversation, and the last question you will ask me today. Goodbye. He was right. I was speechless and hardly moved a muscle as he walked back to the car, got in, and was driven off. I contacted my friends and family and told them we had to go to Europe right now. I explained everything I could, but they all thought I sounded insane. They mostly told me I wasn't thinking straight. That's when the news interrupted all broadcasts. All planes were canceled due to a large solar flare, the largest ever recorded, estimated to hit somewhere in North America later that day. They urged the listeners not to panic and that it was only precautionary. But I knew better. My roommate's been acting weird lately. He's always been a bit out there, but not like this. Never like this. Before I continue, let me give you a little backstory. I'm a student at Bridgewater State College in Massachusetts. 
I share a dorm with my roommate Wallace. We both major in computer science. And that's all we've ever talked about, on the rare occasions that we actually speak to one another. We don't have much else in the way of common ground. You see, Wallace is an odd guy. He's very socially awkward and doesn't have many friends, if any at all. I've only ever seen him talking to his professors, and one time the janitor. Wallace is a recluse. Another one of Wallace's quirks is his obsessive-compulsive nature. He conducts himself in a very specific manner, and has his daily routine mapped out to a T. It never changes. When he wakes up, he brushes his teeth, making sure to gargle and spit exactly three times. He then puts on a striped shirt, followed by khaki pants. His wardrobe never changes. He always arrives to class five minutes early and turns in his assignments a day before they are due. This is how it's always been. How do I know all of this? Well, being a socially awkward hermit, Wallace didn't tell me these things. I don't even think he's aware that his routine is a byproduct of OCD. It's just something I've picked up on during the two years I've lived with the guy. It's almost impossible not to notice. Knowing Wallace's usual behavioral patterns, I've noticed that something isn't right. He's been sleeping in his clothes, not brushing his teeth, and he hasn't passed in an assignment on time in over a week. He didn't even sleep in our dorm room last night. I haven't seen him in over a day. Wallace has his quirks, but he's a nice guy. Despite not knowing him all that well, I became worried. That worry justified me hacking into his laptop to see what he'd been up to. It was the only thing I could think to do. In finding his laptop and turning it on, I felt like a fool. The thing was as clean as a whistle, at least to my eyes. You see, though I pride myself in my hacking skills and tech know-how, Wallace is far more adept in the field. It was safe to say that I wouldn't find a shred of evidence as to where he might be, or what he'd been doing. No journal entries. No browsing history. No nothing. A normal acquaintance, or even a friend, might stop there. But I always took things too far. This was especially true when it came to helping others. I always felt the need to lend a hand whenever I could. Concern is amplified until it becomes borderline anxiety. It's a curse, really. Feeling anxious, I thought about any other potential ways to continue my hunt for the truth. That's when something clicked. Like I said before, I sometimes saw Wallace talking to the janitor in the halls. He was the only person I had ever seen him talk to in length. Maybe he would know more about Wallace's state of affairs. Later that night, I exited my dorm and wandered the halls. Eventually, I found Chuck, the janitor. I tried to be gentle when confronting him, as he had his back to me and was known to be hard of hearing. Still, when I tapped him on the shoulder, he jumped. Holy cheese balls! You nearly scared me half to death! Chuck laughed through his bushy gray mustache. What can I do for you, son? I told Chuck about my predicament and how I was concerned for Wallace, having not seen him in a while. 
Chuck's happy expression transformed into a look of unease and tension. He seemed to know a bit more than I did. Well, here's the thing. Wallace is a good kid. And we do chat from time to time. I happen to know where he might be. But I wouldn't feel comfortable blurting out the details of his social life to anyone who asked. Even if you are his roommate. Social life? Wallace didn't have a social life. I pressured Chuck into letting me in on the secret. I really laid it on thick, expressing a great deal of concern for Wallace's well-being. Being the nice old janitor that Chuck is, he eventually gave in. Okay, okay, I understand. Just please don't tell him that I told you, okay? I nodded, eagerly awaiting for him to reveal Wallace's whereabouts. Wallace has been feeling really down lately. He's got no one to talk to but me. The kid wanted some friends. People that he could hang out with and talk to, you know? I listened closely for the details I so desperately sought after. So Wallace went on something he called... Oh, what was it? The Deep Web? On there he found a group of people... They called themselves the Clan of the Red Wolf, or something like that. I guess they invited him to one of their meetings. That's probably where he is. He seemed pretty excited when he told me about it. In fact, it's all he's been talking about for the past week. There. That was it. That was the bit of info I needed. The key to finding Wallace. I thanked Chuck and gave him a goodnight wave as I ran back to my dorm room. From the sounds of it, Wallace got himself involved with another group of people who share in his interests, and eventually they invited him to hang out in real life. I had their quirky name, the Clan of the Red Wolf. And that's all I needed to find them on the deep web myself. Soon enough, I would be able to find my missing roommate. It took quite a while, but I finally managed to find the deep web forum pertaining to the so-called clan. It contained nothing but a description and a series of videos. Here is the description as it appeared on the site. Welcome to your new belief system. We are the clan of the Red Wolf, and we're here to help. There are seven educational videos on this site, each tailored to a specific belief that we want to share with you. Over the course of a week, you are asked to watch these programs to understand our doctrine. If you make it, to the last one, you will be invited into our den. Good luck. The summary was bizarre, but nothing less than what I'd expected. Scrolling further, I noticed that all of the videos were titled similarly. Day 1, Day 2, and so on. Naturally, I watched them. The whole series reminded me of old war propaganda. It was made in the style of a vintage cartoon, starring a wolf as the main focus. Not a normal wolf, a cartoon wolf. Picture a character similar to Wile E. Coyote. In each video, the wolf learned a new clan value from the campy male narrator. Not unlike old cartoons, the wolf comically goes against the narrator's wishes and suffers the consequences before learning his lesson. Every video ends with the narrator saying, Join the pack. You'll never have to feel alone again. I guessed that was the selling point for Lonely Wallace. 
I will share with you a bit of the transcript from each video, along with any points of interest. Day 1. Wildlife Treat flora and fauna with dignity and respect. They are people too. Trees provide you with the air you breathe, and animals share the earth with you, keeping you from being alone. They deserve more than you ever will. Wolf relieves himself on a tree. The tree falls on top of him, crushing his head and revealing the blood and brain matter inside. Day 2. Thicker than blood. Your blood is the most important material in your vessel. The clan requires a sample upon joining our order. This is a requirement for all pledges. Our blood must flow as one for us to work together and save the planet. Wolf enters a room full of cloaked figures, presumably clan members. All members are in line, giving blood samples. The wolf refuses to have his blood drawn and walks away. A cloaked figure sneaks up on him, slices his throat with a dagger. Video focuses on the wolf bleeding out for a few moments. Day 3. Obey or Suffer Remember what happened to our friend when he didn't give his blood to the cause. He didn't obey our order's rules, so he suffered the consequences. Remember, the clan's laws are important. You must obey or perish. Trust me, it's worth it. Shows the wolf bleeding out again. Only a few cloaked figures are now on top of him stabbing his corpse repeatedly. Day 4 Vow of Secrecy The clan of the Red Wolf is often misunderstood. Because of this, it is important to never tell anyone of our existence, under any circumstances. You may only speak about clan activities with other clan members. Break this rule and you will perish. Wolf is shown talking to his wolf pals and showing them his new cloak. A cloaked figure walks in frame with what looks like a semi-automatic weapon and opens fire. The wolves fall to the ground, dead. The cloaked figure gives a thumbs up before the video ends. Day 5 Learn and understand. If you are allowed into our inner sanctum, you will be greeted with knowledge. We abide by the word of the Red Wolf, and you will too. You will be expected to learn and understand his teachings. Otherwise, you will fail. Not only the clan, but the entire world. Wolf is seen in a classroom environment, taking a test of some sort. He turns it in to a cloaked teacher and receives an F. The entire class points and laughs at him, and then pulls out a plethora of medieval weaponry from their robes and proceed to close in on the wolf. The wolf swallows the lump in his throat before the video ends. Day 6 Tasks and Rituals As a new recruit, you will be asked to carry out various tasks ranging from the mundane to the fantastic. Most of these missions will involve fetching ingredients for our rituals. As boring as that may sound, it is the most important thing you could ever do for the clan. Rituals are what gives the clan power. Without this power, we cannot hope to rid the world of what plagues it. Wolf fails to bring ingredients to clan member for ritual. Jump cut to Wolf being sacrificed on a black altar atop a pentagram, carved into the floor. He is beaten, cut open, and eventually torn apart by his fellow clansmen. 
Day 7. Mortals. When accepted as a fully-fledged clan member, you are no longer considered human. You will be one of us. From that point forward, you are discouraged from any and all human interaction, unless it is deemed necessary to the cause. Humans are vile, filthy, disgusting, and dangerous creatures. We seek to exterminate them once and for all. Any human who knows of our existence and isn't deemed worthy enough to join must be killed. Nature is your only friend. Wolf is walking down a main street like environment and can be seen waving to everyone he sees. He comes upon a clan member who then pierces his gut with a long blade and tosses him aside in the road where he is run over by numerous cars. The content of the videos was incredibly jarring. I almost couldn't believe that such a cult could actually exist, let alone that Wallace would join them. He must have really been lonely. The last video exited with the same Join the Pack spiel and then faded out to a screen with a series of numbers. That was my next clue. I could only assume that it was a code that might reveal the coordinates of the clan's lair. That, I thought, must have been where Wallace had gone. I wrote down the code and immediately started doing some research to begin cracking it. Just as I was in the thick of things, something hit me. One of the videos stated that you couldn't talk to anyone about the clan under any circumstances. But Wallace talked to Chuck. That didn't make any sense. Wallace was a stickler for rules. Another fact hit me. The video stated that you could only talk about clan activity with other clan members. What if Chuck was one of them? Chuck could be stationed at the college to recruit members, and he simply nudged Wallace in the right direction. He could have been playing dumb with me when I questioned him. So, either Chuck was a clansman or Wallace broke a cardinal rule. Neither theory held much water. If Chuck was a member, then why would he have told me anything without either recruiting or killing me? And if Wallace was so eager to be accepted into a strict cult, then why would he disobey their wishes? I couldn't make much sense of either angle. I eventually gave in to the notion that perhaps Wallace simply disregarded the rules in lieu of his excitement. He was finally going to have friends, so he had to tell someone. This didn't completely sit well with me, but I had to get back to cracking the code. I didn't have time to dwell on uncertainties. Just then, there was a knock at my dorm room door, followed by a voice. It's Chuck, the janitor. I'm here to tidy up your room. Chuck never cleaned dorm rooms. That wasn't part of his job. I'm all set. I yelled, hoping he would leave me be. The knocking ceased. There was a long stretch of silence, followed by a soft, metallic creak. The doorknob was turning. <laughs>